Well, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Christian Enmark, and this is the final ANU National Security College Public Seminar for 2011. National security is a term of art in many circles, political discourse particularly, dates from about the mid-1940s. The idea of national security started out as an, an institution, if you like, designed to bridge the traditional divide between the interests of the state abroad and the interests of the state at home. In the United States in 1947, the National Security Act established the National Security Council to advise the American president with respect to the integration of domestic and foreign policies. And so for all that the pursuit of national security can sound like a rather parochial endeavor, policy making and academic analysis in this area is largely about being outward looking. So it is important for scholars, policymakers, citizens to explore, to understand, and to engage with the world around them in the hope that this might be a pathway towards peace, security, and shared prosperity. Australia's security imagination has long been enlivened by thoughts of Asia, and historically Australian governments have sought security from Asia and also security in and for Asia. Australian foreign policy has been driven, unsurprisingly, by a mix of self-interestedness as well as idealistic impulses. And of enduring interest to Australia is that part of Asia to which we are closest, mainland and archipelagic Southeast Asia. And so we are fortunate tonight to have with us my colleague, Dr Christopher Roberts. Chris is a senior lecturer in the ANU National Security College and a visiting fellow at the Australian Defence Force Academy campus of the University of New South Wales. Chris was previously at the University of Canberra and also at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Chris is our college's man on Southeast Asia. Uh, he is also very often our man in Southeast Asia because he has conducted and continues uh, conducted to conduct extensive field work throughout that region. He has built up an extraordinary network of official and academic contacts there and has, in so doing, acquired a very deep understanding of Southeast Asian culture, uh, local history and politics. Chris is the author of two books that are centred around the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, as well as numerous other publications, and he continues to pursue an active research and teaching interest uh, in Southeast Asian regionalism. So, please welcome Christopher Roberts to speak about living with Southeast Asia. Well, uh, thanks, Christian, for a, a very good uh, introduction, indeed, a kind uh, introduction as far as uh, my uh, background is uh, concerned. My starting proposition, well, actually, just before I move on to the, the panel, I just want to say thank you to a number of uh, good friends I see in the audience and colleagues and, and for everyone else who has, uh, who has uh, come uh, today. But my starting uh, proposition uh, is uh, that Southeast Asia is of particular importance uh, to Australia, given its close proximity, uh, only 160 kilometres northwest of Australia's uh, Torres uh, Strait Islands but in turn that Australia is of uh, equal uh, importance, or at least significant importance, for the region of uh, Southeast Asia. In the, the context of uh, Australia's uh, potential influence and, and, uh, and, and power, we can see that Australia stands fairly strongly in terms of the uh, GDP. Uh, here I have the 2009 uh, figures where Australia was just under one trillion uh, US uh, dollars, and uh, Indonesia just over uh, half of that, at 546 uh, billion uh, US uh, dollars. Australia as a, as a country, uh, in terms of its, its importance, we, we can see even just in terms of the land uh, area. Uh, for example, ASEAN's land area stands, and when I say ASEAN, this is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, Southeast, uh, basically the Southeast Asian countries with the exception of Timor-Leste. Australia's land area stands, uh, ASEAN's land area stands at 4.4 million uh, square kilometres, whereas Australia's 
surface area or land area is 7.7 million uh, square uh, kilometers. But there are some interesting changing uh, dynamics uh, taking place. For example, I just talked about the GDP of certain countries. If we look at GDP in terms of purchasing power parity, and I and, and I know others, such as Hugh White, would argue that this is what really matters. It's, it's what you get for your uh, dollar. A lot of people, uh, perhaps in Australia, wouldn't yet realise uh, that Indonesia, Indonesia's GDP, PPP, has actually surpassed that of Australia. So Indonesia's GDP, PPP, in 2010 was just over $1 trillion. Australia's, by contrast, in PPP terms, was $0.8 uh, trillion. Uh, dollars. So we're actually seeing a situation where, for a long time, Australia was perhaps the biggest economy. Uh, it, it continues to have the largest uh, defence budget, that's uh, for certain, but uh, relative to our immediate neighbour uh, to the north, we will increasingly be sort of the uh, smaller uh, brother in some uh, respects. And there are certain implications uh, that stem from that, but I'll, I'll come uh, to that towards the end uh, of the uh, presentation. Certainly at a cursory glance, the uh, size of our economy, uh, the importance of, uh, of us as a nation and our proximity to Southeast Asia has meant uh, that we have uh, traditionally uh, played a, a fairly uh, active role in, uh, for example, regional institutions for multilateral uh, engagement. Indeed, Australia played a leading role in the establishment of the Asia-Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation. Uh, we are also, of course, a member of the ASEAN Regional uh, Forum and a member of the now expanded East Asia uh, Summit uh, that now includes the United States and also Russia. On the economic front, just to uh, uh, mention one example here, uh, Australia has... Uh, uh, entered into an agreement called the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement, and this is often held to be the most comprehensive uh, free trade agreement that ASEAN itself has negotiated with an outside uh, country. And uh, this agreement brings together 600 uh, or over 600 million people uh, now, and a combined uh, GDP in real terms of 3.5 trillion dollars. Uh, if we look at uh, the pace of economic growth in the region, and the red bar represents the original ASEAN members, the ASEAN Five, so Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, uh, and the uh, Philippines, uh, we can see some significant, significant growth, particularly from the uh, 2005 period onwards. What this graph doesn't show is the year 2010, and that growth uh, also returned to a, a fairly significant pace of growth at 79 percent in real GDP uh, terms. Importantly, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations as a collective entity is representing one of our fastest export growth, or f uh, fastest uh, growth in exports as a market, which, is, uh, which reached 24.4 percent for the 2010-11 uh, financial year. We can also see uh, from the Australian Bureau of uh, Statistics that because of this, uh, this growth in, in recent years, ASEAN is now our second biggest trading uh, partner after uh, China. Uh, it sits at 13.9% of our uh, total aggregated imports and uh, exports, and based on current trends, that is likely to continue to uh, grow. Uh, some other examples in terms of uh, the uh, benefits uh, of engagement and our relations with the region include education. For example, in 2009, there were 109,000 ASEAN students studying in Australia, so you can imagine the uh, financial, uh, cultural and political benefits uh, that stem from that. In terms of tourism, in 2008, uh, there were 714,000 ASEAN tourists that arrived on Australian shores. And in the reverse direction, which uh, paints a positive picture in terms of Australia's, uh, or the, the interests of Australians in, in travelling to Southeast Asia, and there were 2.6 million Australian tourists, or at least Australian visitors, uh, to uh, Southeast Asia. 
this uh, provides uh, these uh, trends and general directions provide the advantage of added diversification of our economy. A lot has been said about China in, in recent years and our dependence economically uh, there. Uh, there's a long way to go, but this is uh, somewhat reducing uh, or, or diversifying or acting to diversify the economy. And there are many other uh, 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 benefits, including uh, access to resources, uh, such as uh, a very uh, large uh, amount of protein need, needs uh, sourced from the South China Sea. Uh, there are also many uh, hydrocarbon uh, deposits that have not yet been accessed, partly because in some instances of territorial disputes, which I'll uh, come to uh, in a moment. Beyond economics, uh, security is, at, at many levels, uh, another issue for why uh, a sound and robust relationship between Australia at all levels uh, is necessary uh, with the countries of Southeast Asia and also including the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Just starting with some of the non-traditional uh, security uh, issues, for example, we have the ongoing uh, problem, in fact, increasing problem, of illicit narcotics, such as uh, those produced by the United Wa uh, State uh, Army in the uh, eastern provinces of uh, Myanmar. And we also have some uh, increases to methamphetamine uh, production in uh, Indonesia. In the case of Myanmar, uh, there is an increased uh, prevalence of ice and uh, there is some uh, suggestion out there that uh, they are moving into more advanced products such as uh, ecstasy. Uh, production, uh, which uh, of itself has uh, some market uh, in Australia. As you can see in the uh, uh, circled uh, area, uh, which uh, encompasses Indochina, Thailand, uh, sorry, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, as well as Myanmar, but also uh, adding uh, to that Thailand, we have uh, some particular problems with organised crime, crime that embraces human trafficking, uh, 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 and, and other issues uh, beyond uh, organised crime to include uh, diseases such as uh, uh, problems with HIV, AIDS, prevalence rates, uh, also uh, bird flu. And these all present issues to which uh, Australia uh, needs a, 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 a strong working relationship. And in many ways, if uh, mechanisms can be uh, set for or established for cooperation, at the multilateral level, uh, then that would be the most efficient way uh, to uh, proceed. Beyond some of the non-traditional uh, security uh, issues, uh, we uh, have uh, continued sources of instability, uh, such as insurgencies in southern uh, Mindanao, in southern Thailand, in the uh, eastern uh, provinces uh, of uh, Myanmar. Uh, we have a, a broad array of uh, uh, terrorist organisations of various agendas, domestic, sometimes regional, sometimes uh, beyond. Uh, and, and these uh, issues, again, uh, contribute to the potential uh, uh, possibility of instability uh, in uh, the region. There are continued territorial disputes that can be a challenge, uh, not just for the region, but also for Australia's relationship with the region. Uh, both bilaterally and also multilaterally. And some of these are being uh, uh, driven uh, by increased resource uh, competition. So take, for example, the uh, so-called gunboat diplomacy uh, that took place uh, between Indonesia and Malaysia over the Sulawesi Sea, or other, in uh, other words, the Salibs uh, Sea back in 2005. Uh, then we have other issues, not so much uh, resource, but uh, historical and cultural, uh, and also weighted in uh, uh, weak state legitimacy, such as the recent dispute that led to loss uh, of uh, lives uh, between Cambodia and Thailand over the Prey uh, Beer Here uh, Temple. Certainly uh, uh, another issue that is of increasing uh, concern. I've already uh, hinted at it, but uh, uh, this concerns China and its uh, 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 progress, uh, really, in uh, increasing its influence uh, in various uh, <coughs> countries of Southeast Asia. But this is not a concern uh, that is purely for, say, countries such as our own, Australia, or indeed uh, other powers such as the uh, United States. This is a concern that is 
often debated and discussed within and between the ASEAN uh, countries themselves. So we see, uh, in the case of Myanmar, uh, since 2010, uh, a level of investment that outweighs the previous 20 years combined uh, from China in terms of uh, the uh, construction of new railway lines, uh, gas pipelines, uh, oil uh, pipelines, seaports, uh, a, a new airport, uh, and uh, road uh, networks, which, it, which in some cases have dual purposes, and this leads to uh, increased, and has led to increased competition between China and India in terms of influence in Myanmar. But for the ASEAN countries, there is a concern that uh, uh, some of China's, uh, or for some of the ASEAN countries, there is a concern that some of China's uh, actions have the potential to divide uh, ASEAN. We see similar uh, developments in Laos with the uh, negotiation for a high-speed railway uh, from China through Laos. Uh, uh, also, uh, road networks, the training of officers by the Chinese. Uh, which was traditionally the sort of the role of the Vietnamese, and so in consultations with the Vietnamese, this is an issue uh, that uh, is uh, uh, often uh, raised, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, perhaps most uh, significant of all is the dispute over the South China Sea, which, if you take into account uh, China's claim uh, stretching all the way down to the exclusive economic zone of Indonesia. This then embodies five of the ASEAN 10 countries as uh, disputants to the uh, Chinese claims. Uh, however, uh, by way of uh, one uh, example, the Chinese ambassador to Brunei late last year uh, perhaps let it slip because there's been no mention ever since uh, that uh, China had reached a uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, Brunei. Uh, over uh, joint exploration and development of uh, uh, oil and uh, gas in the uh, South China Sea. Uh, and interestingly, or coincidentally, uh, at the beginning of uh, last year, the CAFTA, China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, entered into force, and the amount of, or the increase of bilateral trade between Brunei and uh, China was 270%. And so you can imagine uh, that there are strong interests uh, or costs or penalties uh, in terms of maintaining regional solidarity. Uh, but the implication, again, here for us is if you have uh, disunity amongst the ASEAN countries, that impacts on the extent to which uh, uh, Australia can negotiate with the region as a whole. It impacts on the uh, feasibility of multilateral cooperation uh, and perhaps introduces uh, additional costs in uh, having to uh, resort to increased bilateral diplomacy. Uh, and, and another thing I just uh, wanted to point out in terms of Australia's uh, influence uh, uh, in the, the region, uh, power is relative, and when you add uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, equation countries such as India, Japan, uh, and also China, uh, you can see uh, that Australia is relatively much uh, weaker in, in terms of uh, relative uh, power distribution. So, for example, Australia's uh, defence expenditure at just under $20 billion in 2009 uh, is uh, far short of what is the official uh, quote-unquote uh, uh, defence expenditure of China at $70.4 billion. And so this also creates uh, challenges in terms of uh, the extent to which uh, Australia can maintain its uh, influence in the region and also our commitments in terms of aid that is designed to uh, increase uh, or improve the quality of governance uh, in the uh, region. <coughs> so some have complained, for example, that uh, China uh, will often uh, <coughs> under undermine aid efforts by giving uh, uh, aid without any form of conditionality, uh, sort of conditionality uh, as, as one example there. Now we can see the impact of not just China's influence but also the diverse history of the region in uh, this uh, 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 result of a, a survey I undertook uh, throughout Southeast Asia. I must highlight here it is a rudimentary uh, indicator of uh, perception. There are anomalies here but we also see some patterns uh, that uh, other research would reinforce. 
we see China uh, being mm -hmm. listed in terms of uh, the top three strategic allies with a, a couple of countries in uh, Indochina. We see countries such as Singapore uh, listing the U United States and a number of other countries also listing uh, the US as uh, significant uh, strategic allies. Interestingly, only one country in the region listed Australia in the top uh, three. And this is a sample, and again, I, I stress it's just a, a rudimentary indicator, but a sample of 100 elite, roughly half the government and half the academic from all 10 of the ASEAN countries. That's including uh, government from uh, Myanmar and also Laos uh, as well. But this strategic diversity, the diversity of history, etc., in the country, uh, in countries of Southeast Asia, also ties in to the uh, relatively problematic threat perceptions. And again, here I would put in a caveat with my sample of 100 uh, people in the uh, survey that perhaps the real figures uh, or the real uh, threat perception is higher, uh, but bias and uh, uh, the, the limitations of getting an accurate uh, 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 response in authoritarian countries such as Laos uh, act to, to downplay some of the statistics. But despite that caveat, for example, only 20% of the Singaporean respondents didn't envisage armed conflict between the Southeast Asian countries within the next 20 years. At, uh, for Thailand, that was 17%, and for Cambodia, that was 14%. Uh, percent. This survey was concluded prior to the Prey Vihir Temple dispute, so the, the statistics on Cambodia and Thailand very strongly coincide with uh, developments that later uh, happened. In terms of a separate but related question, I asked uh, the elite respondents, are there any, uh, uh, do they believe that they can trust all the countries in Southeast Asia to be uh, good neighbours? And in response to this question, around 60% said no. So again, I point and, and emphasise the historical and cultural diversity of the region to explain some of these issues. And uh, by the end of, of this talk, I'll come back to, to how or what some of the implications are in terms of Australian engagement with the, uh, with the region. But I did have the good uh, fortune of interviewing the late Ali Alatas, uh, Indonesia's longest serving foreign minister. And uh, he summarised uh, some of the problems that face uh, the region aptly by stating that at the time of independence, uh, the ASEAN countries knew more about their <coughs> former colonial masters than they did about their own neighbours. Uh, and, and so this is something to, to bear in mind in terms of where ASEAN has, and Southeast Asia has come from in the last 60 or 70 uh, years. Another issue when we think about engaging uh, Southeast Asia, when we think about whether to do it bilaterally, uh, sub-regionally, or at the multilateral full regional level, with uh, ASEAN is the problem of state capacity. Take, for example, the fact that uh, Singapore's GDP on a per capita basis in purchasing power parity terms is nearly double that of Australia uh, now. But then compare <coughs> that to uh, the GDP per capita of Laos, that is uh, closer to $1,000. And then think about what the sort of gap in capacity is in terms of uh, 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 responding to uh, the transit of uh, narcotics, uh, for example, or some other uh, issue that might uh, be uh, something that Australia wishes to target uh, through uh, ASEAN. Another problem we have is the, the mode of how ASEAN operates. So of the actual agreements that have been reached between the ASEAN countries throughout the last 45 or, or so uh, years of ASEAN's history, only 30% of actual agreements have ever been uh, implemented. So this has a significant ramification in terms of what we can feasibly expect uh, uh, within, uh, with our engagement in the uh, region. And part of the problem here is what is often referred to as the ASEAN uh, way. And this involves things such as uh, non-interference in each other's internal affairs and also consensus-based decision-making, which some people uh, refer to as kind of a decision-making based on the lowest common denominator. In many cases, this being what Myanmar uh, as a country will agree to, and it has effectively an implicit, implicit visit, uh, uh, veto on, uh, on anything that takes place uh, in, uh, in ASEAN. 
We also have some uh, challenges uh, in terms of our relations at the, the broader uh, level, and, and this pertains to elite and grassroots or communal level uh, perceptions at, in, in both uh, directions. Uh, for example, I've uh, sat in and seen uh, senior uh, professors uh, talk to classes of government officials in Singapore and define Australia as a militant uh, uh, country, which uh, may be a surprise uh, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, their uh, perception, but they will point to things such as our acquisition of tanks and uh, uh, increases to defence budget, uh, etc., uh, and use that uh, as their own uh, justification. Uh, there is uh, a common perception, as I've lived in Singapore uh, and Japan uh, over the years beyond Southeast Asia, that there is perhaps a far higher degree of racism than is the uh, reality. I remember working with a uh, administrator at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies, and she said or lamented that she would so like to come to Australia. Of course, this is a worst case example here, but she would like to come to Australia, but she wasn't sure that she could put up with the racial slurs. Uh, part of the problem here is uh, some of the, uh, the populist rhetoric of uh, politicians serving their own agendas or perhaps distracting local uh, uh, constituencies from domestic uh, problems and also the role of the media, which in many cases is state-owned. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of prevalence given to, for example, the One Nation Party, uh, and that's still remembered uh, as I travel uh, through uh, the region. But even in, in uh, more recent times, uh, speaking with one uh, uh, government uh, employee from uh, Indonesia, uh, he uh, talked about uh, how uh, the uh, press has uh, re referred to or responded to uh, the, uh, the boy who uh, uh, was found in possession of marijuana in uh, Bali and how that was referred to as the Bali boy. Or there was another, uh, another uh, article that talked about a uh, 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 plane and engine falls or lands on Indonesian island, or some paraphrase thereof. And uh, from, the, from his perspective, it, it sort of, he thought, oh no, you know, another Indonesian plane has, has crashed. It uh, kind of Im implied that. It turned out it was a, a Qantas uh, uh, plane. This is a discussion that took place uh, uh, yesterday. Um, but uh, so, so there is uh, certain things that take place that uh, can or has impacted on, on perceptions from the ASEAN side uh, and also uh, perhaps some of these uh, issues, uh, for example, that same uh, official in speaking, speaking with me uh, stated that uh, when he speaks to the local media, uh, uh, they say that uh, the, the way they talk about Indonesia is partly driven by uh, the demand and what uh, sells in terms of an article by the, uh, by the Australian uh, public. Uh, so he expressed uh, some degree of, uh, of frustration uh, uh, there. Uh, I've also had uh, stated uh, to me that uh, there was also frustration over the uh, Julia, Prime Minister Julia Gillard's announcement of the pro uh, possible processing uh, centre in uh, Timor-Leste. Uh, 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 there, the uh, uh, the uh, concern was that Indonesia was not privately uh, consulted. So just perhaps in some cases how uh, we approach uh, certain issues. They also felt that Australia was a little bit behind in terms of an awareness, at least from an Indonesian perspective, whether right or wrong, uh, that uh, Dili will very rarely act without consultation itself uh, with uh, Jakarta. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, they also felt that this reflected poorly, uh, perhaps, on our, uh, on our diplomacy, uh, but perhaps under-acknowledged uh, the extent to which uh, some uh, populist uh, politics are taking place <coughs> at the domestic uh, level uh, here. But this also ties in to uh, Kevin Rudd's uh, proposal for the Asia-Pacific uh, community. Uh, going back to when it was first announced, I was still working in Singapore, and uh, a number of Singaporean colleagues at the Rachel Ratnam School of International Studies were standing in the hallway and uh, uh, somewhat mocking the uh, proposal. Barry Desker, Ambassador Barry Desker, Dean of the RSIS, uh, was quoted as saying it was born dead in the uh, water as a uh, proposal. 
the problem was, from the ASEAN perspective, is that uh, to get something uh, through, to, to get it approved uh, at the regional level, you need to undertake quiet uh, diplomacy. You need to follow the regional norms and approach of doing things. Build up a consensus and only announce it when that it is basically a fait accompli. And so this lesson stands for both of the last uh, two examples I've, I've uh, just uh, 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 mentioned. And, uh, and so this uh, was, uh, this uh, uh, impacted in, in terms of, uh, again, perceptions of uh, Australia. Nonetheless, there are, again, uh, moving back to the uh, positive uh, side, some very important uh, developments. And I think none more so than what we have seen in terms of the remarkable transition that has taken place in Indonesia. This started, of course, with the collapse of Sahara's New Order regime back in 1998, following the uh, Asian financial uh, crisis, and, uh, and then led to the adoption of a reformasi uh, process or period of reform, reformasi Bahasa, Bahasa Indonesia. It was interesting that by the period of 2004, we could see a stark contrast in how Indonesia responded to issues compared to, say, a country like Myanmar. So when the tsunami struck uh, the shores of uh, HA, and bearing in mind this is a particularly controversial or sensitive area, given the conflict still ongoing at that time, Indonesia not only <coughs> welcomed foreign aid workers uh, to this uh, region, but they also welcomed foreign militaries. Contrast Myanmar, which uh, uh, not only, uh, well, uh, which blocked for weeks uh, the uh, entry of any <coughs> foreign aid uh, workers into the uh, country. We've also seen, in line with the transition uh, towards a more consolidated form of democracy, change regional diplomacy. And one example concerns Myanmar. Uh, 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 and we, we saw the Ali Alatas, who I mentioned before, being appointed as a, a sort of a, a, a special uh, envoy on behalf of the president to try to uh, lobby or, or uh, push Myanmar towards uh, political reforms, uh, and also when Myanmar was blocking uh, the uh, uh, entry of aid, at one point the Indonesian uh, foreign minister, this is according to a political source in Singapore, leaned across the table and asked the foreign minister of <coughs> Myanmar what he thought ASEAN membership meant to Myanmar and what, at that time, uh, membership meant, to, uh, and what at that time in those circumstances Myanmar's membership meant to ASEAN in terms of ASEAN's internal coherence, international profile, and its uh, membership's shared vision for the future. So according to this particular ambassador in Singapore, the implication was clear from the perspective of Indonesia, Myanmar's membership in ASEAN was at stake. This is a very significant departure from the type of diplomacy that we have seen in past uh, uh, decades. And certainly on this point, uh, the Director General for ASEAN within Indonesia's Foreign Ministry, otherwise known as DEPLU, stated, I believe on this issue, non-interference. We are more open now. Indonesia is more open, more flexible because of the democratisation process. So what does this mean for Australia? What does this mean in terms of our potential opportunities uh, for engagement uh, in, the, uh, in the future? Well... One good example, I think, stems from Indonesia's draft plan of action for a security community. This is still not a public uh, document, as far as I'm aware. However, uh, in the 75 points that were proposed as a future vision for <coughs> Southeast Asia, this included a human rights commission that, unlike uh, what actually took place, would actually have teeth, and a regional peacekeeping uh, force. In fact, if you look at Indonesia's vision uh, for the future, there were many areas of complementarity, many areas of uh, where uh, uh, there was some overlap with uh, Kevin Rudd's vision for an Asia-Pacific community. So perhaps in retrospect, uh, looking uh, back, uh, perhaps uh, had Australia gone to Indonesia first and said, we really uh, you know, uh, uh, agree and uh, like your vision for Southeast Asia, can we perhaps work together to expand this as a vision for the broader uh, Asia uh, Pacific, uh, we may uh, have uh, the, there may have been room for uh, more progress uh, at 
uh, that uh, uh, level and through that uh, approach. And, and certainly, Australia's strategic uh, 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 position as a uh, ally of the United States does not go unnoticed. There are mixed perceptions uh, within uh, the region of Southeast Asia. But for example, Alexander Downer wrote an article earlier uh, this year where he talked about uh, Indonesia, uh, 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 Indonesia's proposal to send a battalion to Iraq. Now, they didn't go directly to the United States. They went to Australia to act as a kind of intermediary. Uh, Australia then contacted, or uh, the Australian government, uh, had a consultation with George Bush at the time. And from, according to Alexander Downer, from Australia's perspective to the Australia's disappointment, uh, the uh, offer from Indonesia was uh, turned uh, down. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, some positive developments in the relationship. Things are not problem-free, but we've seen the formation of the Lombok Treaty, and while some lament that it's perhaps, from some people's perspectives, not as strong as the previous treaty, at least it is progress. We saw earlier this year a new law criminalising people smugglers. And uh, talking to defence officials in Australia, I hear that just in, in many uh, levels, at many levels, there's a, a general uh, improvement in terms of the level of cooperation, dialogue, etc., taking place between Australia and uh, Indonesia. And again, I think the important point here is to emphasise that uh, Indonesia as a democratic nation really is starting to, to uh, enter into regional diplomacy that in, in many ways is almost very hard to distinguish from the kind of diplomacy and the goals and the interests that Australia has as a democratic nation uh, in uh, the region. And while uh, Indonesia and Australia are relatively, still relatively equal in terms of some uh, uh, measures of uh, power, perhaps now is one of the best times and perhaps one of the last best times uh, for Australia to really move forward in terms of building a strategic uh, and political relationship that will uh, serve us well for many decades uh, to come. But the kind, same kind of perceptions may also hold sway in Vietnam, and somewhat to my surprise, in talking with a senior party official about six years ago, uh, he reflected saying that Vietnam would actually have nothing against legally binding uh, measures uh, in uh, uh, in organisations such as ASEAN, subject to the principle of consensus-based decision-making. Uh, it didn't take long before the South China Sea issue uh, came up. But nonetheless, uh, this, uh, these changing strategic realities uh, uh, provide both challenges and also opportunities in terms of what we can achieve uh, with certain individual uh, countries. A another issue moving... Uh, much further on to, I guess, the soft power uh, dynamic that I do want to uh, touch on is Australia's long-term role uh, in terms of uh, education exchanges, uh, military exchange uh, programs, the Australian scholarships uh, that we uh, offer. Uh, I remember uh, the, uh, 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 in terms of my access to interviews, I felt uh, that I benefited from some of the relationships that were established when Many of the uh, people in government had actually been to Australia at some point in their life. And I also remember a Vietnamese uh, colonel uh, who, uh, after doing a master's program in, uh, in ADFA, returned back home. And uh, we should never underestimate the impact of having a year or two uh, in the uh, country, he reflected, and uh, uh, on, on uh, what took place or, or what followed. And he was saying that he would come into a meeting and, uh, and they'd be discussing how to respond to a particular issue. And he was a little bit over-enthusiastic after two years here and he was like, well, Australia does it this way. Perhaps we should look at uh, this other model of Australia or whatever. Sadly to say, he was fairly quickly uh, demoted. <laughs> but nonetheless, he has been promoted once again, but he now serves the best on Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, not anything to do with uh, Australia. But still, uh, it, had, it had an impact. And if you talk with people such as uh, Peter Lay, uh, uh, former Chief Farming Professor over at the University of Canberra, he will uh, and has reflected to me on how some of the relationships built up in past decades uh, served Australia well in terms of him or other uh, people in the military being able to pick up the phone 
and have direct dialogue with someone who had done some training or exchange or a degree and was now in a senior position in the military. And that these connections actually helped to uh, uh, reduce uh, tensions uh, around 1999 over Timor-Leste. So in, in coming towards uh, the, the conclusion here, I do see uh, some very uh, uh, positive opportunities uh, for Australia. Uh, building on my analysis in, of Indonesia and how uh, the behaviour of Indonesia has moved towards, uh, uh, in a positive direction, where there are new opportunities for engagement and, and closer uh, collaboration. Uh, I also see at the, the broader ASEAN uh, level some uh, transition taking place. We're seeing this in particular uh, with Myanmar uh, recently. Uh, indeed, uh, Freedom House International notes either six or seven of the ten ASEAN countries over the last ten years have improved in terms of the uh, civil liberties and political freedoms. Uh, in my own survey, while 46.7% uh, of the elite respondents indicated that the principle of non-interference was, was as important now as it was a decade ago, and not insignificant, 39% said that it was no longer as important uh, in uh, the region. Interestingly, on a slightly different uh, 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 control question, I asked, are there any circumstances where some ASEAN member states could be justified in diplomatically intervening in the internal affairs of another member state or states? And here, 55% said yes. So we're seeing a, a somewhat of a transition there. But eventually, as we're seeing in the Middle East, as we've seen in the Philippines and in Indonesia as well, the uh, governments and the elite are eventually, if not beholden to, at least somewhat influenced by the uh, values and the demands and the needs of the people. <coughs> and in a separate survey involving seven different languages, covering nine of the ten ASEAN countries, but with a Myanmar sample from Blue Collar Workers in Singapore, we see here fairly strong support to the issue, is democracy important to you uh, personally? The one exception being Brunei, and I put that down to uh, oil wealth and the, uh, the benefits that uh, stem uh, from that. Why would you want change uh, there? So in terms of conclusions, my main point here is uh, traditional security issues, things where uh, you know, territorial disputes, political issues with potential human rights, uh, ramifications, etc. These are the areas where multilateral engagement at this point in time, with the mix, current mix of authoritarian regimes in the region, are the most difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, there are also other uh, risks uh, that we need to be aware of. Uh, some years ago, people thought that Thailand was a fairly robust democracy, and then we saw what took place in 2006. There is no guarantee that similar events wouldn't take place in, say, the Philippines, or indeed Indonesia. Let us hope not, but there is that risk. The area where multilateral cooperation is particularly feasible is on the economic uh, front. This is because if you're a democracy, you're simply representing more people. If you're an authoritarian regime and uh, co collaboration actually improves the economy and people start to gain uh, the wealth for a mobile phone, a car, a better standard of living, then this leads to performance legitimacy and this detracts uh, from the risk of people protesting against the government. The Singapore model has long been you know, one of the exemplars of performance legitimacy until uh, recent years and, and recent political liberalisation. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and one other issue to keep in mind is that uh, uh, we will still and will continue to be increasingly challenged by strategic divergence generated by China and other major uh, powers. And there's possibly going to be increased co uh, competition over aid engagement and, of course, uh, influence there. And for my final slide, I'd just like to comment in terms of military and defence engagement on this particular issue. Bilateral and sub-regional will be the most likely. It's rare that we see much uh, beyond. Uh, of course, we have the five powers defence arrangement, uh, but other examples tend to be trilateral, such as the eyes in the skies over piracy between Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore. With multilateral institutions, I think the les lesson of the APC was that we should really uh, uh, strategically uh, defer to ASEAN and its current uh, institutional role in the EAS, the ARF, etc., and reinforce its driver's seat role. 
because any other country would only, to, to try to take the leadership would only generate a competition and tension with other powers, whereas ASEAN is seen as a kind of neutral collective uh, body for these organisations. Australia needs to continue with its aid uh, to, to help with capacity building and good governance to the extent that we can move countries such as Myanmar at this critical juncture in time forward uh, and reinforce political liberalisation in the country will also have a reciprocal benefit in terms of the extent to which we can cooperate on narcotics and other issues whilst also alleviating the risk of instability and the consequences of, uh, for example, illegal smuggling. So education exchange remains important as well. Uh, for example, the University of Southern Queensland, uh, it used to have a course uh, called Australia, Asia and the Pacific, and it was mandatory for every student in every faculty to undertake this course. So every student who graduated from the University of Southern Queensland left with a better and deeper understanding of the region. But this needs to go all the way through to our schools, uh, teaching in high school of history and also language schools, and of course our scholarships are on track uh, there. But finally, at the end of the day, it all gets back to uh, our political uh, leadership, uh, the need for, uh, I think, greater bipartisanship on sensitive uh, issues to do with foreign affairs, and the, uh, the uh, carrying out of a stronger vision for the future in Asia, and hopefully the current white paper for, uh, on Asia uh, uh, is a step in the right direction there. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, taking us up to 6.30, we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, very comprehensive, and yet I'm sure people will want to ask you some things. Sure. So who would like to put a question to Chris? Yes, please. Um, William Kuchera, now with the University of Dundee, but formerly uh, with RSIS in Singapore. Um, you mentioned the FPDA towards the end of your presentation. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier this year at the Shangri-La Dialogue, the UK Defence Secretary spoke of the need to modernise the FPDA. Do you think this is something that can or should be done? And if so, in what way? Yes. Now, that's, that's an important uh, question. I believe there was actually uh, uh, some sort of track two dialogue that actually took place in Singapore that led uh, to certain uh, sensitivities. The government was actually uh, somewhat upset with the, the role of RSIS, uh, but uh, as to whether that was because they were promoting it or, uh, <laughs> or the reverse, I'm not quite sure. But certainly I see the, uh, the uh, fight power defence arrangement as, well, not necessarily a critical pillar of, of our immediate regional architecture complementary is, is just one extra uh, layer of cooperation. Um, it has uh, benefits in terms of just maintaining relationships. It keeps Malaysia and Singapore involved as, as countries that have traditionally had some difficulties uh, in their uh, uh, relationship uh, and it builds other bridges uh, as well and, and has uh, uh, you know many uh, tangible uh, opportunities and, and, and benefits in terms of uh, future activities uh, in, uh, on functional cooperation concerning, say, non-traditional uh, security issues. So I think it's, it's something that uh, is, uh, the region is better off with uh, and, and that we should keep, uh, keep it there and, and, and do seek to uh, reinforce it to the extent that is possible in the uh, interests of uh, the, the five powers. The, the idea of the Asian Pacific community, lately there has been some comments saying, well, at the end of the day, the essential, the critical elements of that has been reflected in the enlargement of the um, East Asia Summit. Uh, do you think this is the perception that the, the countries of ASEAN have about it as well, that they actually the in somehow the, the enlargement to include uh, Russia and the United States of the East, East, East Asia Summit has the, conveyed the idea of the creation of an Asia, uh, Asia Pacific uh, actually, uh, community. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, that's a very good question and something I actually uh, in, in, meant to uh, have a, a quick statement uh, on. It's certainly a positive outcome, uh, even if it was uh, perhaps unintended, uh, was that uh, when the ABC community idea came up, 
uh, and, and this is sort of following history. Uh, with APEC, uh, then you had a, a kind of uh, uh, concern by the ASEAN countries uh, that uh, if, if they don't take leadership in terms of the regional architecture and the Soviet Union, also at one point had suggested a, a, a possible regional security uh, institution. So ASEAN sat there and, and said, if we don't take leadership, others from outside will step in. And, and hence the uh, creation of the ASEAN Regional uh, Forum, in part. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that, that's the, the broad uh, uh, story. Uh, likewise, with the Asia-Pacific community, it did spur a debate internally uh, between the ASEAN members, and the positive uh, outcome of that was to decide to enlarge the East Asia Summit. So you are quite correct. That was... Uh, uh, and, and bring in the US and, and Russia. The... Uh, the biggest concern I remember <coughs> discussing with some of my ASEAN uh, <coughs> colleagues like uh, Rizal Sukma uh, and, a, and a, a Thai counterpart up in uh, Kuala Lumpur at the Asia Pacific Round Table, I think last, uh, last year, uh, one of the key concerns on that issue was uh, if they did include the US, would the US attend every uh, year? And this, was, this gets back to part of the culture as well and the face saving. So that was also an issue. They, they felt it would be really undermined unless you could sort of bind the US to, to be part of it, not just optionally in or out. And uh, so that was another component of what was uh, a concern expressed amongst the uh, uh, regional uh, analysts and elite. Yes, uh, thank you. <coughs> uh, Ian Dillon, Canberra Grammar School. Um, going back to the screen that showed the uh, ranking of strategic allies, yes. and only one country, Singapore, listing Australia in the top three. Um, were you surprised by that finding? And um, if so, why? If, if not, why not? And what would Australian institutions or the Australian government need to do to uh, change that ranking? Yeah, it's, it's a, a, a very uh, good question. I guess by the time I uh, conducted uh, uh, the survey, I'd already uh, been living for some years in Asia, so it wasn't that much uh, of a surprise in answer to the, uh, in answer to the first uh, part of your uh, uh, question uh, uh, there. I think there is there are a, a, a number of elements to the second part, some of which are difficult for us to do much about and others maybe we can do a, a bit about. Uh, part of it is that we are, you know, at best a, a, a middle power. Uh, but we do have the benefit of being very proximate uh, to, uh, to uh, the region. Uh, but there are uh, limitations in terms of strategic assessments from ASEAN countries uh, with their neighbours and beyond once you start adding countries like uh, China or uh, the US, uh, etc., to the mix. Uh, for example, uh, under what circumstances would we ever compete? Uh, with the US in terms of strategic importance to the Philippines, uh, as, as one example there. But nonetheless, uh, uh, the fact that Singapore, uh, on this indica rudimentary indicator, put us as, as third, despite the fact that they do training out here and, and helicopters and other equipment uh, are, are stored uh, here, uh, perhaps in, in part there is a perception uh, in the region that we have no or lack consistency in terms of uh, whether we feel we're a part of the region or not. And, and perhaps when I'm saying this, I'm limiting that debate at the political elite of Australia, uh, leaving out the, the public and, and what they think. Uh, but uh, over you know, a spectrum from Paul Keating you know, uh, through to uh, the, the present time, there have been very many mixed and different phases and different mixed messages. So I think a starting point would be to be more consistently and at a bipartisan level, uh, you know, strongly uh, stating uh, the importance and declaring the importance of Southeast Asia and some of its individual countries. I remember Hugh White making an interesting point some weeks ago, saying that up until the 1990s and, and the time of, say, uh, Paul Keating and uh, Gareth uh, Evans, uh, you had uh, political leaders willing to stand up and say that Indonesia in general in broad terms, is of primary strategic importance. It's, it's a critical country for Australia's security and future. 
but since the turmoil of the late 1990s, uh, these statements typically tend to be much more issue specific. No one sort of the political leaders aren't willing to stand up and make such a strong assertion to the public. They talk about Indonesia as important in terms of combating people smuggling or other you know specific issues. Uh, and 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 so there are uh, there are things that we can do in terms of our consistency, in terms of how much we genuinely declare our intentions and the importance of the region at the regional level and also with bilateral uh, relationships that I think could uh, help in the longer term and maybe at least get us on more than one country in terms of the top three strategic uh, allies. So, um, thank you. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, lately, we have seen following the visit of US President Barack Obama to Australia, the presence of uh, American troops will be enhanced in Australia. So how do you think that, uh, you know, according to some information that we have received, Indonesia is not happy about such a move. So how do you think uh, uh, such concerns could be, you know, uh, uh, taken on board by Australia and the region and uh, such fears or such concerns are it? Thank you. No, that's, a, that's also a very uh, important uh, question. Uh, I remember seeing uh, Marty uh, Natalagawa, the uh, Indonesian foreign minister, who I met with uh, just a couple of uh, uh, months ago in uh, Jakarta. And, and of course, he's been very much a friend of, of Australia. He was uh, uh, spent part of his time uh, being educated. He's, I think, uh, at least one, if not more, of his children have uh, been educated here, or are currently being educated here. Uh, in Australia, and he actually stated uh, that he, uh, or uh, actually he didn't, but an Indonesian colleague stated that uh, he tends to like to try to make at least one trip a year out to Australia, but then it was interesting to see him make a, a statement uh, that was quite uh, uh, negative uh, as, as one of the more su uh, supportive uh, political elite uh, in Indonesia. Uh, but I was talking with Peter Lay uh, the other week about that, and, and both of us were not sure you know, was that responding to domestic uh, uh, constituencies, uh, pressure from other uh, politicians, uh, uh, etc. But certainly beyond, and of course speculation on individual motive was, was always uh, uh, a dangerous area to, to get into. But all I can say in broad terms is, uh, again, uh, maintaining uh, dialogue as much as possible. I don't know the dynamics behind the announcement, for example, in Australia, I don't have any information on when Australia first informed Indonesia of this, of this uh, proposal, but certainly uh, having dialogue and making Indonesia feel as much a part of our processes and decision making and a valued uh, strategic ally, uh, I think, uh, is the key. It's, it's, it's what stems from uh, the language both explicitly and our actions implicitly uh, as well. So. Possibly one last question, maybe, sir. Just stand here again. I'm from ATSA. I um, um, have a question, sir, related to, I mean, U.S. and Australian relations, I mean, uh, I mean how the Asians, Southeast Asian people see the U.S. and Australia. I just feel that sometimes the people in Southeast Asia uh, not very welcome, you know, Australian as warm as it should be. It's got Australia have very close relation with the U.S. and sometimes they see Australian as this, I mean, the the deputy sheriff. Mm -hmm. And in that way, that would not very all the time they see that the very 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 good way that the people should want because it means so these Asian people want to be consulted on any important decision and to should talk more about it whenever before it happened, especially in the case of the 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 US and troop in will be in, in Australia now. And it should be when from the other South Asian country perspective, it should be consulted them. Yeah. And how should you think that about about that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Hi. Uh, I think uh, this, this becomes a, 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 a complex issue because when you're starting to deal uh, uh, with uh, some of these issues of, of uh, defense and, and keeping in mind what I just said in terms of consulting with Indonesia, 
there are also limits, I think, just to, just to give the other side of the, the, the coin in terms of just how broadly and widely we can consult uh, about, say, things such as defence relations. Because if we were put it into the reverse, just how much we would expect Myanmar or some other countries to consult uh, with us, uh, I don't think there would be much uh, mm -hmm. we could expect uh, uh, there. But having said that, I do agree there are, I mean, I've gone into interviews and uh, with, uh, uh, you know, certain foreign ministries in, in, in the ASEAN countries, and I've been asked how's the deputy sheriff uh, going, mm -hmm. sort of half in jest or whatever, but in actual fact, myself and John Ravenhill, the head of CAS, uh, went to the uh, to Kucha Jaya in uh, Kuala Lumpur, or north of Kuala Lumpur in 2008, involved in a project uh, funded by the ASEAN Secretariat on the East Asia Summit, interestingly enough, and that was my one hostile uh, interview, where uh, the uh, Malaysian uh, there, quite a senior official, thought that uh, we were acting on behalf of the Singapore and uh, Australian governments in some kind of conspiracy. Uh, so I have seen uh, some some elements of uh, 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 distrust uh, based on uh, just Australia being Australia or, or its relations in other cases with the US, but I have also seen, uh, I think, uh, uh, more often than that, uh, most often, in fact, uh, a general recognition, especially when in private consultations, that uh, there is something of benefit for the region by Australia having our relations with the US, there was in fact a lot of concern about, you know, within ASEAN, within Southeast Asia, of a possible US withdrawal from the, the region in terms of the war on terror distracting the US. And of course, China did what it could to, to fill the vacuum and then take advantage and make diplomatic inroads. But for some countries, that was highly worrying. And uh, the fact that Australia has such good relations with the US and it, along with what ASEAN is doing, such as through the East Asia Summit and, and the expansion of that to include the US, uh, yeah. that, this, that the sum total of these efforts help to keep the US in, I think more often than not in ASEAN is seen as a positive uh, uh, side beyond perhaps the populist rhetoric of certain media uh, sources. Uh, well, we find that it's 6.30 and so we're out of time. Thank you so much, Chris, for being so thorough. Uh, in your treatment of this topic, and uh, it's a great ANU tradition uh, that if you're going to be researching and teaching about particular parts of the world, that you go into those parts of the world and live and breathe them to the best of your ability, and I think Chris really does that. Um, thank you all of you for coming along tonight, and thank you indeed on behalf of all my National Security College colleagues uh, for your support and interest throughout this year. Uh, we all wish you a very... Uh, safe and relaxing uh, holiday break and we look forward to you joining us again in uh, 2012. Um, but for now, please join me once again in thanking Dr. Christopher Wallace.